Hi. Um, what I would like to talk to, wow, that's very noisy. OK. Uh, what I would like to talk today is about uh, ability to automate your machine learning pipelines in a scalable way using machine learning, nuclear functions, and Kubeflow. So usually when one thinks about the data scientist work, they think that most of the time is spent on defining the KPIs, finding the right algorithm to solve the problem, and tune it. Surprisingly or not, most of the time is being spent, or rather said wasted, on plumbing all the infrastructure in order to bring this model into production, to bring the model into life. This is a slide taken from Google, uh, but we held last month an ML Ops conference in New York, and we heard the same problem coming up from most of the participants and attendees. So it is a very acute issue with ML Ops uh, at the moment. So we need to find a simple solution for better data integration and automation. So when I'm saying plumbing, what does it really mean? So it can take weeks for a single data scientist to come up with a model, but it will take months of several people, including DevOps and data engineers and the data scientists, to really bring this model into life because they need a lot of packaging, dependencies, running scripts, building, scale out. There are different notions of scaling out depending on the framework that was chosen. There are different ways to partition the data depending on the framework that was chosen. There is the hyperprompt, is GPU support, integration with GPU, parallelism, tuning, monitoring all those kind of work, logging, taking care of the artifact, the security, CI, CD, that's the plumbing that needs to be done. And we need a way to automate all those different steps, taking, reduce the time that it takes a model to get into life and reduce the amount of models that are dying in the process. So let's a look, take a look at a very uh, simple example of a machine learning pipeline. This example is talking about a customer recommendation based on location. Like if I'm in the mall and I'm usually buying a that and that product, what would you recommend me to buy now? So there is the ingestion part. There is tons of transactions coming in, ingested, all the transactions by all the different customers um, swiping their visa. There is the location where the customer is currently located, those kind of Ingestion to the stream is coming in 10,000 events per second. There is information about the products, about what is being held in the store, and customer tables, like what is the gender, what is interest, what is usually buying, what is interested in, all the information that you can preserve on customer depending on what you have on him. And you can also scrape information from the, for example, environment, if it's a rainy, they you would like to propose winter product to that customer. So all this information is being ingested and being saved in a base feature store. We have a data preparation, labeling, stuff like that. Save again to a derived feature store. Then we do the training, finding uh, the correlation between different products. If I'm buying this product, usually I will buy that and that product as well. All this is being, uh, trained into a model and to a learned feature store, which will then be used by the model. Then I'll, I'll deploy the model, and when now I have information about the location of a specific customer, I can provide a customer ID and its location, and the model serving will provide me of what I need to send him as a product to sell. So if we look at this quite simple a machine learning pipeline example, we see, as usual, there are four stages. There is the ingest, the data preparation, the data training, and the serving. And automation and serverless has tackled the ingest and the serve, and we'll see in a moment how it's been tackled. But the data preparation and the training are not yet to be handled. So introducing Nucleo. Nucleo is an open source serverless framework 
which was developed with machine learning pipeline in mind. It can handle virtually any type of source of event, from Kafka, from Kinesis, Eventab, Papsa, RabbitMQ, Cron, HTTP, of course. It has integration with NVIDIA Rapids. It has a real-time mechanism embedded within it. So within each one of the function pods, there are multiple workers working concurrently without any blocking, with zero copy notion. Each one of the workers, when there is the other worker um, leave the CPU, the other one can take it, and it <coughs> uses GPU optimization. And of course, it's natively integrated with Kubeflow and with Jupyter Notebooks. So how was the ingest uh, being used? So for in this example, you can see that there is a simple Python code that by moving that code and invoking it using a nuclear function, you get almost 30% more throughput. And why is that? The reason is the parallelism. Nuclear, you have multiple workers that can, can take ingest information in parallel, does give you a much higher throughput in a low latency kind of a fashion. It's a very simple way to move a code from one other to another, and it's virtually, as I said before, can get any type of event, but it can also get any type of data within the event. So it doesn't have to get numbers, it can get images, it can get uh, URLs and stuff like that. Model serving. So you can use Nucleo to serve models. It really uses, uh, does a resource uh, utilization, and you can see in this example, the same kind of code running a GPU system. With Nucleo, you get four times the performance as in an equivalent uh, system. You can also get twice the performance on a reduced system. And it's a very simple notion to take a notebook, and we'll see that in a moment, a Jupyter notebook, and to convert it to Nucleo. So it's very easy to deploy. It gives you a great resource utilization within the same pod. And of course, as serverless, it uses resource on demand. It means that it can scale up, add more replication to the function if needed. If you have a huge burst, for example, then you get more replication for that same function. It can re reduce even to zero if there is a downtime or non nothing is in, uh, triggers the function. So it gives you a resource on demand. So serverless is such a great notion. It solves the ingestion and the serving. Why not use that for data preparation and training? So if we take a look at, se at several characteristics of serverless and data preparation and training, we see that they don't fit. If we look, for example, at the task lifespan, in serverless, the times to take and use an event is millisecond to minutes. Data preparation and training, it's seconds to hours to many hours. Scaling, in serverless, the scaling is very easy. You put a load balancer in front of the functions, you get a trigger, it will redirect it to one of those functions. In data preparation and training, the scalability is much more difficult and there are so many different ways to partition and to scale the infrastructure, and depending on the real-time engine underneath it. You can do partition and shuffle as being done, for example, in Spark. You can do hyperparams, ring or reduce as being done in Harvard. So there are many different ways to scale and parallelize your workload, and it's very dependent on the engine, the framework that you choose to run with. State, serverless is stateless, and data preparation and training is, of course, states, it's all about data intensive kind of a workload, and the input is different as well. So it's not that easy to take data preparation and training, which are data intensive and batch oriented, and make it serverless, but we still want to have the ability to take the serverless concept, such as on-demand resource utilization, using only when needed, use, ability to uh, increase the resources as needed and to decrease them. And we would like the automation 
the build and automation of deployment, not worry about the servers, where it's run, how to run it, and stuff like that. So what we did is we took, we wrapped different uh, engine, such as Spark, uh, TensorFlow, Horvod, Nucleo. We wrapped them around, such it will abstract, and each one of those different runtime will handle the scalability and the um, parallelism within it. We attached a fast data layer underneath, so it, they can preserve the state and the different uh, uh, data itself, and attached, a, a added an abstraction layer, which removes the operational burden from you. So it takes care of monitoring and building, and artifacts, and all kind of uh, operational overhead that you usually have, and provide you with the ability to code once and to move it, to run it on different runtimes, we just a change in it, something like two lines of code, and we'll see that in a second. So before going into the demo, and the demo will show you uh, ML functions. All the demos can be found in GitHub. ML Run itself is an open source, which is in early development stages. You, we encourage you to have a look in GitHub at ML Run to add different runtime engines to it and different storage as, as you see fit. So, is it, can, can you see? Zoom in. Better? Another? <laughs> okay, so, so I'll try the demo and may the God's demo will be with me and the network as well, so let's give it a try. So uh, I'll start with a very simple um, demo, which is the low word of the machine learning, it's the iris model. And we'll take a look at that, and from there we'll move to a more complicated kind of a demo. So first of all, you see here uh, Jupiter Magic. Here it's a nuclear annotation, which will tell later if we'll take this Jupyter notebook and convert it to a function, a nuclear function, which can be easily done. It will tell how uh, this uh, needs to be configured within the function itself. So you'll see here around uh, the notebook, there are different uh, annotations to instruct how to build the functions. So we do all these pip installs. We configure some base image for the nuclear function. But most of, if more of all, this is the methods uh, that holds the information for how to operate that training. So first of all, we have this method, which is iris generator, which take the data sets embedded and save it as a CVS, CSV, sorry. Then we have a method for XGB train, which take this file, define a text parameters, hyperparameters that will provide it to it when it's being called, and creating and saving the model. Do you see what I'm marking? Yeah. And there is another method to do some uh, plot iteration. It's like building the histogram of the results. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm creating an ML function and running it. So there is two ways to provide a run with information. I can define a task, which we'll see next, or I can provide it explicitly with, with the different parameters of the job to be run. So in that case, we chose to provide it within the run itself. So we have a job named Iris Gen. This is the handle to the method we've just uh, saw, and the parameters is where to locate the file. As we can see here, the result is the job itself. It's in state completed. We can see the artifacts, we can even see the artifact himself that was created. 
by this run. Next, we want to train the model. So we are taking, defining parameters, and now we're refining it in a task. So we're defining a task, the different parameters that we want to invoke, the hyperparameters that we want this run to run, and provide it they run the task. This one will run within the Jupyter Notebook itself. I didn't provide any runtime information, so the local one is being chosen. So this training, is, is it's a very small data set, it can run within the Jupyter Notebook itself, was, has been run within that notebook. But I can take the same task information that I, with all the parameters that has just been used, and now run the same training on a remote, paralyzed way using a nuclear. So I'm, I'm taking the same code, convert it to a nuclear function now, providing a runtime of machine, nuclear machine learning, attach it with a shared uh, data volume, and defining that the HTTP trigger should have 16 workers, and I deploy this function. So all the compiling and build, building the container for the function is done for me, I didn't do anything. Let me just move to show, for example. Okay, so can you see? I need to zoom again. Okay. So this is the UI for Nucleo. Nucleo, of course, is open source. So you see here, it's the code, the methods that we've just seen. What I wanted to show, it's the configuration of this function. So you see that all the, the annotation that we use within the Jupyter notebooks are now within the pod itself. We have uh, the base image, the different pip installs that we had there, the V3IO, uh, which is the volume we attach to that uh, function. We can also see within the triggers that I have 16 workers for HTTP. I can that easily add another trigger to a function. What I didn't mention before, and it's very important, it's nuclear, it's not just that it can handle different, many different triggers, it can handle different triggers within the same function. So I can add another, like Kafka, which has the same notion of different event, and add another trigger to that function. Moving back to Jupyter. So I, have, I now have this function being deployed, it's running. Now I want it to invoke the train, so I need to provide it with the parameters that I uh, defined earlier. And it's just that easy. I'm taking the address, this is the address of the function, and we are using that to, to do ML function run, providing it the task that we defined earlier and used to run on the Jupyter itself, now the same thing. This training is run, is run on a nucleo in a parallel, like using the 16 workers that we have defined. And we have the job results for this training as well, using all the logging, the input parameters, uh, and the artifacts. So what we've seen is that I could take, very simply, the same code, run it in a different aspect, different runtimes, and all the scalability and all this notion and the building and the monitoring and the logging is done automatically for me. So let's assume that I did all this kind of playing with the Jupyter Notebook and I'm now very happy with my result and I want to use it in Kubeflow. So I want to define the different steps and to create a Kubeflow out of it. So it's very simple to do that with ML Run. I have here uh, within the pipeline uh, four steps. The first one is the ingest. It's the same code that we used before. It's the in uh, Iris generator. And its output is the data set. Then I have a training uh, step, train. And we see that it gets as an input the data set that was created as an output of the Iris data set, of the previous step. And it's, the output is the model itself. And we see next that the plot can take the model and do a plot of iteration. 
And we can take a, a function and create a model serving for that, a, using that model. And with that simple definition of how the artifacts should move from one step to another step, we can now run a, this and create a pipeline. And we can see this pipeline I prepared ahead of time. So we see this is the pipeline that was created. We have the iris going to the training. And then we have two parallelized stages, the plot and the deployment, deployment of nuclear function. If we go to the plot, for example, we can see in the artifact, this is the nice histogram that was created uh, by the training. We can see the logs. We can see all the other information that was created by, while running this job. So we saw a very uh, easy way uh, to take a code, convert, run it on different runtimes, and then take it to the next step and automate it with Kubeflow. What we'll see next before we go to a different kind of job is how we can take Nucleo and use it with KF serving. So KF serving defines methods of a model, how it should, should it be called. So every model needs to have a predict method, and it could also have a other methods such as explain and pre and post uh, functions, in addition to functions that the model itself can uh, declare. So what we'll see here is that you can use Nucleo as a model serving within KF serving, but, and you gain the serverless notion out of it. So when you use it with KF serving, you still need to compile and build and do all the notion for that image. With Nucleo, uh, the, this burden is uh, lifted out of you, so you can, and you gain the performance uh, of of Nucleo as a serverless. So we see here, I'll do it very quickly so we'll have time for the next demo. We are defining again um, the pip installs, the imports and stuff like that. And we define a predict. The predict is actually calling uh, the code that we uh, seen yet, uh, before with using the model. Okay, so now I can take and create a model server. This is its name providing it with a model that uh, we already stored with the training in this uh, directory, and deploy it. And now, and now you can see if I want to use an event to invoke that function, KF serving is using a protocol of seldom, which is kind of an array uh, of numbers so we need to convert the event to that array, and we can invoke uh, their serving. So by that, we get the notion of KF serving, but with a parallelism and automated kind of a thing. If we go for, I can't see you, sorry. We can see the function. It's, again, with the predict and everything, and you can use that the same notion as with KF serving. So I'll move to the next uh, demo. This one is taking a little bit more complex kind of a job. It's utilizing a hovered, which is distributed TensorFlow. So it's using this kind of an engine. So I'll briefly go on stuff that we already talked about, but we see here that there are uh, steps here, this, this open archive method, which take the images out of S3, uh, bringing them to the system. There is the categorizing map builder, which is labeling and categorizing uh, the different images, which one is cat, which one is dog, and oh. defining what as categorize uh, we have within this model. We're preserving uh, at this stage, two different artifacts, the categorizing map and uh, the files themselves. So now we, again, we can create a very simple task. This is the task definition. It's a download. It has the different parameters, and we can create an ML functions using that task. We are seeing here all the completion and everything of that step 
We don't need to worry about, to monitor about the artifacts and stuff like that. The next stage is to tag the images. Again, it's, a, it's running here. And the third step is actually do the training. So uh, this training is more intensive and it's using a Horvod in order to do that. So we are defining the Horvod file, the different parameters. There is the different uh, data paths and all those uh, file as an input. And simple as that, we create a new uh, machine learning function, giving it a name, command of the opera, uh, MPI job, and apply a different uh, configuration for that job, such as how many replicas we want for that MPI operator. Four means we have, we'll have four worker pods that does the job for us. We can easily, just with this line of code, add GPUs, attach GPUs to this uh, job. I didn't have one on my system. And run again uh, using the parameters that we defined and give it a name. So this job has taken something like half an hour using four different pods running remotely. And we see that it's completed. And we can see, let's see if we can see that, never mind. And now when we have the model, we can deploy that. But before we going into the model, I want to show another thing which is ML run UI. The same uh, notion uh, of job tracking as we see in the Jupyter Notebook, we can much better see with this, within this UI. And as opposed to Kubeflow, it monitors every different job that you have. It's not just the Kubeflow, the jobs that run in Kubeflow, you have every job that was run through that machine learning pipeline here. And you can see different information, inputs and artifacts. So we can see that the training, this is the plot of the training uh, of, of what we have just run. Okay, so I can now take the same, as the same notion as before, take and create a function uh, for the model serving using the model that we have just been uh, created, setting its specific environment that we need. And as opposed to, uh, uh, the need to use NumPy array, we can use with Nucleo different type of triggers. So you can invoke that function using a URL. And we get, you see that it's a URL, we get it's a cat. And you see here that we def send it in the image. You see in the context that we send it as a JPEG. And we got a result that this one is a dog. So I get just five minutes, so I'll move very briefly, showing that the entire thing that we just seen, we can use it now with Kubeflow very easily as we've seen. We create a function out of the code. We define for a Kubeflow the artifact path, the different stages. Here we have a, a stage with doesn't need an artifact from uh, the previous stage, but we still want it to run after, after the, the labeling is after the data ingestions. So we provide an after. So this one label will run after open archive. Then we'll have the training that are using the output of the labeling. It uses those as an input. So implicitly, Kubeflow will run this step after the previous step, and then we can deploy it, uh, deploy the model as a modeling serving function. And I prepared in advance, this is how this pipeline look like. We can see for the training the different input parameters. Uh, you can see the logs of the run and all those kind of a notion. So, so I'm out of time, so if you have questions, that's 
this is the time, but before that, I would really want to encourage you to have a look at ML1 and ML1 demos. Everything that was shown here is within GitHub. It's an open source. I encourage you to look at that, play with that, and contribute to ML1. And Nuclear is also an open source, uh, which you can contribute to that as well. Thank you. Questions? Any questions? We have the two minutes. No? Okay. Um, encourage you to, oh, we do. I encourage you to go on the sketch and review the, the slide and then keynotes again at uh, 520. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the same function can have multiple triggers. Uh, it can have yeah. an HTTP trigger or it can also have event based triggers like Kafka and so on, right? So, uh, how does the scaling work then? Uh, does it how does, it, how does it rationalize these multiple triggers? So, so the scaling in Nuclear is based on two different aspects. It can either look at the CPU, see, uh, and you can define if it's above 20% CPU or 50, then scale to the next one. Yeah. And it can also look at the time a, a event was waiting in queue until it's being handled. So you have both options, and the both options is applicable for HTTP triggers and for the streaming. Got one more for you. Sure. So where does your data come from within your organization? Do you have to pull it from many different sources? I couldn't hear the question, sorry. Where does your data come from for your training within your organization? Do you have a data lake? Do you, have, uh, do you pull it from Oracle okay. databases? Does it come from many different sources? Yeah, so specifically, Guazio has a data a fabric of its own, but it can also integrate with different uh, uh, data layers, such as S3, local file system, and others. ML1 in specific is not uh, coupled to any type of data storage. It can work with file system, it can work with data frames, and it can, uh, other data uh, elements can be added to the abstraction layer as well. So does it answer your questions? That's just a demo example. The data could reside in a KV, in a time series, in any other format. It could use in parquet files. In this example in specific, it was an iris model, which was the data set is come within the model itself, but then you move it out to a CSV. One more. All right, we're running out of time. We got one more. How can I? I couldn't hear. All right, thank you, Aura. We'll, we'll finish yeah. the conversation right here. Thank you.